Okay, check, check. And we are live. And we are live, everyone. This is the first inning radio show live on television radio for television media. And uh, I am the BX Bomber 2011, and I am along with Roger, the Big Yankee fan. Say hello, Roger. Hello, BX Bomber. Things are going pretty good today. How are you doing today? Pretty good, man. Really cold. <laughs> yes, yes. We're supposed to be having some uh, a major cold snap coming up by the middle of the week. In the uh, Midwest right now, they're having brutal, brutally cold temperatures. Right. That's um. Yeah. Well, allegedly, but... Uh, let's yep. see if it snows in New York, but we'll see until then. But today's topic, uh, we, we're going to spotlight uh, different Yankee players or different players in baseball or sports in general. And uh, today's um, player is is Elston Howard. Now, Elston Howard was a New York Yankee, and he was actually the first black player on the Yankees. And uh, you want to elaborate on that, uh, Roger? Oh, sure, sure. I have a lot of this information here, and I've written quite a bit of it down. And if anyone wants to go back and check, they can go right to Wikipedia and find a lot of this information. His full name was Elson Jean Howard. He went by the nickname Ellie. He was born February 23, 1929, and he passed away at a young age on December 14, 1980. He was an American professional baseball player. Howard um, on the field was a catcher, left fielder, and a coach. During a 14-year baseball career, he played in the Negro Leagues and Major League Baseball from 1948 through 1968, primarily for the New York Yankees. He also played for the Kansas City Mar Monarchs and the Boston Red Sox. In 1955, he was one of the first African-American, he was the first African-American player, as you said, uh, to be on uh, the Yankee roster. This was eight years after Jackie Robinson had broken it, broken the, the Major League Baseball color and, and barrier in 1947. On. And that's right. And and the first black manager on the Yankees. Well, not manager, coach. He was the first black coach. And uh, the Yankees still have never had a black manager. Yeah, that's and, true. Uh, yeah, he was the first black. Uh, uh, he was the first black coach, and. Uh, Howard was uh, named the American League's most valuable player for the 1963 pennant winners after finishing third in the league in slugging average and fifth in home runs, becoming the first black player in the American League history to win the honor. He won gold glove awards in 1963 and 1964 in the latter season, setting American League records for putouts and total chances in the season. His lifetime fielding percentage of 993 was a major league record from 1967 to 1973, and re he retired among the American League career leaders in putouts, seventh, uh, 6,447 putouts, and total chances, uh, ninth at 6,977. So he really was uh, some type of player, and he really did have uh, quite a uh, good career. Yeah, Elton and, Howard had a lot of clutch hits. Yes, he did. He and, and a lot of clutch home runs, too, man. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and he really uh, was was a great player. He, is, he was born in St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and his father's name was Tra Travis Howard. And his wife was named Emmeline Hill. And she was a nurse at a local hospital. When he was six years old, his parents divorced and his mother remarried. Howard was a standout athlete at Vashon High School. And I have a bit about his early career, too, about his early baseball career. In 1948, 19-year-old Howard turned down scholarship offers from Big Ten universities and instead entered the Negro Leagues, right. where he played with, with the Kansas City Monarchs under you know the famous manager Buck O'Neill. Buck O'Neill, if you've ever seen uh, Ken Burns' baseball, Buck O'Neill was interviewed quite a bit. And, oh yeah! Uh, Ken, oh yeah! That's right, Buck O'Neill. Yeah, he has. Uh, he was. He he's interviewed quite a bit, and I highly recommend that uh, that that uh, that documentary by Ken Burns. It is uh, a long one. Yeah. And, 
I think it's what fourteen innings now. I, I think so. They keep mm-hmm. uh, they keep adding on. You know, they they added on. Uh, uh, they finished it up really yeah, in the early nineties. Yeah, they did the last one. The last one was like uh, like two years ago or something like that. The final chapter. Right. I think it was um when they did the nineties and early two thousands till now. That's the last. Right. Year. I think that's like the twelfth inning or thirteenth inning, something like that. Yeah, I believe they they went up to the Yankees winning the World Series in two thousand nine. I believe. Yeah. I believe they've gone that far now. Yeah. And and when Howard uh, first came up, he was an outfielder for three seasons, <laughs> and re- he roomed with Ernie Banks. Ernie Banks is another great. Uh, player that came into the major league, a Negro uh, player that came into the major league, wow. and uh, the, the Yankees signed Howard on July nineteenth, nineteen fifty, after he was purchased along with Fred Barnes. They were assigned to the Muskegon Clippers, the Yankees farm team in the Central League, and Howard missed the nineteen fifty one and fifty two seasons due to his military service in the U.S. Army. So he was in the uh, Military, you know, right around that time of the Korean War, and that is pretty interesting as well. Yeah, at, at and, that time they did a draft for that too, didn't they? Uh, yes, they did. Yes, they did. At that time, uh, at that time, and uh, Truman had been coming in, but then uh, Eisenhower took over as president at, at that time. And to talk and, about the Korean War, my grandfather was in the Korean War. He's in. Wow. The, he, was, he, he was in the first uh, army platoon. That came out of Puerto Rico. That's the uh, 64th Regiment. Wow. Wow. That is great history. That's great history. You have yeah, to man. cherish that. Absolutely. You know, that, is, that is wonderful history. And uh, then in 1953, Howard played for the Kansas City Blues of the Class AAA American Association. The next year, the Yankees invited Howard to spring training and converted him into a catcher. So he was converted into a catcher. Despite the presence of Yogi Berra as the Yankees' starting catcher, and then he played with the Toronto Maple Leafs, which everyone thinks of as a hockey team. Yeah, now, that's true. Uh, of the Class AAA International League in 1954, where he led the league in triples with 16 to go along with 22 homers, 109 runs batted in, and a 3.30 average, winning the major league, winning the league's MVP award. And the Yankees assigned Bill Dickey to work with Howard in order to develop his catching skill. So Bill Dickey, the great catcher from from the 20s and 30s, uh, was assigned to work with uh, Howard. And uh, the best amazing things. And uh, also, a um, lot of information about the 1950s. Yeah, because uh, uh, yeah, uh, that's when he first debuted in 1955. Uh, and uh, that's when he became the first black player. Exactly. He be, became the for first, the Yankees. Uh, for the Yankees. Yeah, that's as I said. As I said earlier, for the Yankees, where Jackie Robinson had broken the color barrier in 1947, and uh, Elson Howard was the first. And Howard made the Yankees major league roster at, at the start of the 1955 season, just as you said, on April 14, 1955, the second game of the season. Howard made his, his major league debut when he entered the game in the sixth inning as a left fielder. Howard hit a single in his only play appearance of the day. He became the first African American to play for the Yankees. That's right. And Howard, and Howard was known to be very slow of foot. This caused Casey Stengel, the Yankees manager, to say, Well, when they finally got me an N word. <laughs> I get the only one who can't run. Leave it to Casey Stengel to say something like that. And that is something, you know, Casey Stengel was quite a character. Yeah, he was, man. He was something else. That's a whole nother uh, uh, radio show for that. Oh, yeah. We'll, we'll profile throughout the uh, year. We'll do a lot of profiles of Yankee players from the past and managers and everything. Yeah. And when Howard first came to the Yankees, uh, the came to the Yankees, Stengel referred to him as 8-Ball. Yeah. Howard, Howard made his first start on April 28th because it was difficult to find room for Howard in the lineup. Barrow won the, his third MVP award in 1955, and Mickey Mantle and Hank Barrow were solid outfield regulars. St- 
they will use Howard as a backup catcher and occasional outfielder. He, he uh, competed for playing time with Norm Seaborn, who, Seaborn, who was a uh, Yankee from the 1950s, and Enos Slaughter, who came to the Yankees as a veteran. Mm-hmm. He hit he hit 290 with 10 homers and 43 runs batted in, and 97 uh, games played for the season. And now we'll get to the 1955 World Series. Yeah, that was and, a big one too, man. Yeah, so that was the year that the Yankees lost to the uh, lost to the Brooklyn Dodgers. The only time the Dodgers beat the Yankees in all the times they played one another in the World Series. And the 1955 World Series against the Brooklyn Dodgers, Howard hit a home run off of Don Newcomb, who was also a uh, black player that came into the major leagues. In his first at bat in the second inning of Game One. The round tripper tied the game at two to two, and the Yankees went on to win the game six to five. Howard's ground ball out to Pee Wee Reese in Game Seven ended the series. It was the first time in six meetings that the Yankees had lost to the Dodgers. And in the 1956 World Series against Brooklyn, he played only in Game Seven, but his solo home run off Newcomb in the fourth inning was one of four Yankee home runs. And Johnny Cuts nine to zero victory, yeah. and he so he really uh, did quite a bit of a World Series heroic. Yeah, a lot of clutch hits, man. <clears throat> exactly, exactly. And then again, the Yankees were in the World Series in 1957, right against, against the Milwaukee Bra- uh, Braves. Right, and his three his Howard Elson Howard's three run homer up Warren Spann with two outs in the ninth inning of Game Four. Tied the score four to four, so Milwaukee won seven to five in the tenth inning. And then, as the Yankees again met the Braves in the 1958 World Series, his impact did not become notable until Game Five, when he caught Red Red Dot Shane Deeds. He was a famous uh, player, sinking fly ball in the sixth inning, made a throw to, to catch Bill Bruton on first base for a double play, preserving one to nothing lead. And uh, so it really is amazing. He had uh, quite a uh, quite a career. Yeah, man. No he, doubt he, about was, it. he was playing a lot, man. Then in uh, by 1959, they started playing him at first base over there, and, oh, and yeah. that's basically where he remained in the lineup. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Well, what he did really is uh, he he pretty much took over for Yogi Berra as catcher because Yogi Berra was getting older. Right. And and then he he really started to move in and become the starting catcher, and they moved Yogi to the outfield. And for the 1960 situation, in 1960, however, in 1960, Howard finally took over the the, the majority of Berra's catching duties. Although his 245 batting average was his lowest to date in 1960, and the Yankees met the Pittsburgh Pirates that year in the World Series, and Howard's two-run pinch hit, pinch hit homer off Roy face in the ninth inning of Game One brought the Yankees within two runs, though they lost six to four. Howard hit 462 in the series, but did not play in Game Seven after being hit on the hand by a pitch in the second inning of Game Six and. Did could only watch as the Pirates won the series, and uh, ten to ten to nine was that final game when Bill Mazeroski hit that home run yeah. in the bottom of the ninth inning. Over the and, head of um, Yogi Berra in left field. Right, exactly. They the classic old film clip of Yogi Berra going back against the wall and the ball flying over the wall, and the Yankees. The Yankees really dominated that series. Really, they beat the Dodgers, uh, the Pirates. By huge amounts, but the but the Pirates managed to win four games. And, and also, um, also <laughs> over there in Pittsburgh, where that field was, I think it's a university now, on that site or something like that. Yes, yes, and, yeah. And that wall and that home run wall is still there. Wow, wow, that was uh. Yeah, that home run wall field. is still there. It's still there. It's still there to this day. The home run wall. Because that was so big of a thing that happened to them in uh, Pittsburgh, they actually kept the wall. Right, right. I Pittsburgh. don't know if it's the whole complete wall, but that wall where that home run went over, where Yogi Berra stood in front of, that 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 wall is there. Wow. Yeah, because uh, there's two big universities in Pittsburgh now. There is Pitt, 
and there was Carnegie Mellon. My sister went to school at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh when she was uh, studying uh, music, and uh, and uh, she was in Pittsburgh for a few years, had a nice apartment in uh, a section called Squirrel Hill, and Squirrel Hill was the site of that horrible shooting in the uh, Jewish community uh, just last year. Oh, really? And, oh, and my, yeah, there's so many, man, that happened, I forget. Wow. Right. Yeah, that's and right. My sister had an apartment there, and she went to Carnegie Mellon uh, studying music, and we saw the Pirates play the St. Louis Cardinals at the Pittsburgh Pirates New Stadium. And that is a beautiful ballpark. That is a beautiful ballpark that they have. It has That's a what they say. A beautiful view of downtown Pittsburgh and all the bridges. And uh, that's for sure there. I hear uh, they yeah. have, like, beautiful murals over there. Like, in the stadium, like, of the players, like, of Roberto Clemente and all that. Oh, yes, yes. It's a very classy ballpark. It's not as large as Yankee Stadium. It holds, I think, about 37, 38,000. But it's a very lovely ballpark, and it's right next door to the stadium where the Pittsburgh Steelers play as well. Yeah. Yeah, it is so a beautiful. I, uh, it, it is a beautiful park, man. And I don't know if you saw the movie uh, Jack Re uh, Jack Reacher with uh, Tom Cruise. No, I didn't see that one. Well, that's the opening scene. Uh, a whole big shootout happens where the stadium is in that river. Wow, and wow, you get to yeah. see the whole, you know, scenic view of what it really looks like in that area. So that's a good movie to check out. Yes, exactly, exactly. So anyway, in 1961, Howard uh, raised his average 103 points to a career best 348 batting average. And um, the team that featured Roger Maris' 61 home run season. Howard also enjoyed his first 20 homer campaign along with 77 runs batted in that year, as the Yankees set a major league record with 240 homers, which, of course, has been broken since. He finished 10th in the MVP voting that year, uh, won by Maris. Meeting the Cincinnati Reds in the 1961 series, he and Bill Scallon had solo home runs in a 2 to nothing Game 1 victory, and he scored three runs in the final 13-5 to win in Game 5. And then he followed up with a 1962 season in which he batted 279 with a career best 91 runs batting in, batted in, again, again hitting over 20 homers and collecting eight runs batted in in an August 19th game against Kansas City, which the Yankees won 21 to 7. Although Howard wow. batted only 143 in the 1962 World Series against the San Francisco Giants. Uh, the Yankees won in seven games. You know, that was uh, the San Francisco Giants World Series in 62 when uh, when the line drive by Willie McCovey ended the game, wow. ended the final game. So that is pretty interesting there. And he won the, uh, Howard won the M MVP again in 1963. And he batted 287 with 28 home runs and uh, 85 runs batted in that year. So he certainly did have uh, quite a career going on. Yeah, man, and that's why his numbers retired in Yankee Stadium, number 32. Oh, yes. Well, you know, we both love Monument Park, no, that, no doubt about that. Absolutely. And you, uh, on the final game of the, uh, the final vlog of the 2018 season, you take the fans back into Monument Park, so that's really good to check out. And uh, in his later career, uh, Howard struggled in 1967, and he packed up Dave Gibbs and batted only 198 through the start of August. On August 3rd, 1967, Howard was traded to the Boston Red Sox for Pete McGreeny and a player to be named later, who turned out to be Ron Klinkowski. So he batted only 147 for Boston. He was effective in handling the pitchers. Teammate Tony Conigliaro noted, I don't think I ever saw a pitcher shake off one of his signs. They had too much respect for him. And in 1970-67, Howard also took home, took over Shemmy Lawler's major league record for career fielding percentage. And, uh, and uh, so he really had quite a uh, career there. He finally ended up his career with the Red Sox. And 
on, on October 29, 1968, Howard was released by the Red Sox. Over his 14-year career, he batted 274 with 167 home runs, 1,471 hits, 762 runs batted in, and uh, and he had a a uh, major a major career, a very good career for a catcher. No, he sure and, did. His slugging uh, average was 427. Well, you're breaking up. Oh, wow. Uh, let me try to move a bit. Okay. Am I coming in any better now? Yeah, you're good. Okay, you just tell me because I'm down in the basement with a spotty signal. You got it. So man. He, but, you sound, but you've been sounding real clear. But he's played in 54 World Series games, man. That's a lot of games. Yes, exactly. A total of 54 World Series games played in. Played uh, and it's only behind his teammates Barra and Mantle in the amount of World Series games played. Exactly, exactly. And of course, uh, uh, Howard uh, returned to the Yankees uh, the following year, where he served as the first base coach from 1969 to 1979. Remember, right. he was, uh, and he was the first black coach in the American League. And uh, the right. team won the, the Yankees won the uh, pennant in 1976. In the World Series in '77 and '78, he was the first black coach, but the first black manager was uh, fr- uh, uh, Frank Robinson, right? Uh, yes. Frank yeah, Robinson the, was a was coach. It Larry, I mean, was it Larry Man- Doby? Huh? No, no, Frank Robinson. You're right. It was Frank Robinson. Yeah, he was player and manager. Yeah, he coached the Indians. He managed the Indians. Yeah, yeah, he was manager and player. The first black coach, a uh, first black manager. And player at the same time. How come we don't see that anymore? Uh, you know what? The African American population in the Major League Baseball has gone down significantly, and it really is a case Sad. of uh, you know we still have a lot of dark skinned players or African players of African uh, descent, but uh, they are largely Hispanic now. Yeah. You know they are uh, Caribbean players, and we don't have many African American players. I mean, we have some really good ones, no doubt about it, like Mookie Betts and everything. But uh, Both uh, guys. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, you can go on, you know, of course. Curtis Granderson, so on and so forth. But uh, the African-American population in the major leagues has really dropped significantly. And that's why they have started the RBI uh, program, reviving baseball in the inter- inner cities. Because yeah. the... You know the uh, the black Americans, many of them that are athletes, are moving on to you trying to play bat- football and basketball and that kind of thing. And that's true, and, man. Nobody's really playing baseball anymore. That's so sad. You know that's that's the deal. That's the deal. A lot of white kids are playing baseball. It's much more expensive now to try to make a career out of baseball. You know, you know, you have all of these leagues that are that are leagues that you have to pay to be in. Yeah. And then get into the colleges. If you ever watch a college baseball game, it's largely white players in college baseball. Yeah, and, yeah, because because and, they didn't have the money to be there. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, my family member has just come home, so she may check in. And I'll say hello to her really quickly. Okay. But uh, also, do you remember the game against the? Uh, Against the Boston Red Sox in June of 1977, when Reggie Jackson um, was called in from the outfield by Billy Martin. That's right. Billy. He was part of. He was part of the uh, of holding them back. Uh, him and Yogi Berra had to get in the middle between uh, um, uh, Reggie, Reggie Jackson, Jackson and, and, Billy Martin. and Billy Martin. That's right. Before they were going to fight. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Billy Martin felt that Reggie Jackson had had uh, roast after a ball hit in the outfield, and the Yankees were having a bad game against the Red Sox. And he called him in, and Billy Martin jumped at Reggie Jackson. And Elston Howard, who was a big man, really came in and stepped in between them and uh, really was responsible for keeping that uh uh, taken care of at that point. That is a very famous scene in the in the dugout where Elson Howard jumped between them. 
Yeah, man. Yeah. He wanted uh 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 Reggie Jackson wanted to kill uh Billy Martin, man, for taking well, him out of the game. They they mutually were going at it, and it looked really bad. It was in the dugout of Fenway Park, and Alston Howard really stepped in. And Alston Howard was a big man and held Billy back, and that is a famous scene involving Alston Howard. And you know and, something? Um, that's right, but. In the whole thing of his career, they failed to mention that in uh, 1967, before he was that year before he was traded to the Red Sox, he was uh, in spring training. In, I mean, he was in the winter leagues in Puerto Rico, and he oh. and, and he was practicing before a game, and he slipped on home plate to throw to second base, and he and he hit his elbow on the home plate. And oh, at goodness. that time, he needed Tommy John surgery. Nobody knew what that was. So that's why his career diminished after that. Wow. That's basically wow. why they got rid of him, because he, he, he got hurt. Right, right. So injuries were catching up to him as well. Yeah, he broke his arm. He pretty much, like, tore his arm. Whatever he did to it, he really tore his arm. And he couldn't really play anymore. That's why he had to go to first base. Right, right. And then after Howard's uh, coaching career ended, he became an administrative assistant for the Yankees. However, that position did not last long due to due, due to declining health. And Elson Howard was diagnosed with myocarditis, a rare heart disease that causes rapid heart failure. He was considering a heart transplant, but his condition quickly deteriorated. After staying a week at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital in New York City, Howard died of, a, of, of the heart ailment at the age of 51 in 1980, and he was interred at George Washington Memorial Park in Paramus, New Jersey. Uh, Rudd Smith, who was a columnist for the New York Times, reacted by writing, the Yankees organization lost more class on the weekend than George Steinbrenner could buy in 10 years. <laughs> oh, my goodness. But, uh, yes, he passed away very young of the heart ailment yeah, at the man. age of 51. A uh, very sad situation. And then, as you, you were saying earlier... They wore, the, they wore the black armbands in 1981 when he died. Yes, yes. And Howard's memory of the Yankees wore black armbands on their sleeves during uh, the 1981 season. And on July 21st, 1984, the Yankees retired Howard's uniform, number 32, and dedicated a plaque in his honor for, for Monument Park at Yankee Stadium. And on that day, the Yankees also gave the same honors to Roger Maris, who, unlike Howard, was still living. Howard's plaque describes him as a man of great gentleness and dignity and one of the truly great Yankees. Yep, so that that's is right. really information about uh, about a uh, great uh, Yankee player. No yeah, doubt about that's it. true, man. That's totally amazing. Now he was a great guy, man, and and he and he helped the Yankees win a lot of championships, man. He certainly did. He certainly did. As I said, uh, he he had very very good numbers as a catcher. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. That's he right. uh, he really. Uh, was a player that uh, had a lot of class and a lot of dignity, and certainly was uh, certainly was a great player. As again, I'll say his career batting average was 274, and he hit 167 career home runs, and he had 762 career runs batted in, and debuted with the Yankees on April 14, 1955, and uh, his last appearance of his major league career was September. 29th, 1968 for the Boston Red Sox. That's right, and so, he's also credited with inventing the uh, the donut for the uh, for the bat. Oh wow, that is a little tidbit I did not know. Yeah, he uh, he he invented that, and uh, I guess the ball players still use that today. Yes, they, they certainly do. They I use a so. uh, it's a it's a rubber shell with lead weight in it, and, right. it, and it goes right through the. Uh, and the bat goes right through the circle like a donut, and they can wave the bat around with extra weight on it. And he actually exactly. invented that. That's cool. Exactly. That that is that is uh, that is fantastic. And for lots of times at that time period, they would pick up multiple bats and swing them around. Yeah. So that will be pretty good. 
So we'll uh, get our next uh, podcast going. That's right. This and, is uh, the, it's, it's it's been a great podcast. So uh, one like everybody, well, radio show, and uh, it's been a great radio show. And I want everybody to subscribe and like, share, and uh, we'll see everybody on the next one. Okay, take care, everyone.